Welcome to David and David on Real Estate. Join us as we explore the ins and outs of the real estate market. Good morning and welcome to the David and David on Real Estate podcast. David, we are on episode number 72. 72. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, and uh, today is going to be the last episode we record in uh, 2022, uh, just before Christmas and the New Year. So thank you, everybody, for joining us and, and tuning in. Uh, we've had some great attendance and some great numbers, uh, and people are really tuning in, which is uh, which is great to hear as well. And yeah. we're glad we're adding value. And um, I'm going to remind the audience, you, reach out to David Corman, reach out to me with any of your questions. We'd love to hear from you. We're always available and we're always looking for feedback so we can continue to add more value um, and, and keep you guys entertained. Yeah. And, and the feedback is, is really nice that we've been getting. And, uh, you know, it, it is the holiday season and I, I've been very fortunate in the last couple of weeks to attend a bunch of events you know, such as yours, you know, Sutton Summit, a beautiful year-end Christmas celebration lunch with a lot of people there, and it was great, and I, and I was fortunate to attend a couple others, too, in the last couple of weeks, so I've really seen a lot of people, which, which is great, because after not being able to see a lot of people for so long and not be able to go to those type of, of functions, it's really nice to attend them, but so many people came up to me and said, you know, I've, I've been following your, your podcast, I've been watching stuff, you know, it, it's really helpful, you know, and this is, this is rooms full of agents, primarily. Um, and and that's who's watching it for the most part, you know, we know, there's some first time buyers and other people in the market that that tune in on the advice of their agents and stuff too. But it's mostly agents that have been watching and, and we are really getting some great feedback that they, you know, they love certain episodes. Not every, not every episode is created equally necessarily. We've had some fabulous guests, David. It's not just me and you. We've had some really guests that have, you know, the great guests that have carried us. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, you know, leaning on their expertise and adding their knowledge and sharing the knowledge with everybody um, has been, you know, one of the uh, the, the great part of, of doing this together. And we continue to, you know, we, we want to continue to bring you more value in 2023. And, um, you know, I think uh, you guys are going to see that we're, we have some great guests planned in the new year as well. So i uh, really looking forward to it, David. Yeah. And anybody reach out with any suggestions and topics you want us to get into or, or guests or suggestions, like, please, um, we're, we're open to everything. But uh, th this, it's been a a good year, an interesting year, uh, for sure. <laughs> when you look back on it, it was like two different years. The first six months of the year was was one market, one experience for everybody. And the last six months have been completely different. So it's made for different challenges. It has been. And, uh, you know, I, I think the theme of the year has been shift. Right. That's been the biggest theme of the year. And, you know, you have to shift your mindset. You have to shift how you do your business. You have to shift how you approach your business. And, and the realtors that have continued to put the hard work in, that have continued to systemize their business, that have continued to hustle, that have continued to, you know, put the hours in, um, are, are doing extraordinary well. And then we're seeing the realtors that, you know, get influenced by the negative media, the negative mindset, and, 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 and the mind shift hasn't happened. And those are the realtors that are sitting at home and are missing opportunities, right? So you have to decide for 2023, which category are you going to fall in? And, and, and listen, you're going to be correct whatever decision you make. Because that's the story you're going to tell yourself. And, and that's going to become your reality, whether you choose to get influenced by the negativity and sit at home and say, oh, my God, the market's crashing, prices are falling, number of transactions going down, my buyers aren't qualifying, there's no inventory out there, I have nothing to sell, you're going to be correct. Or whether you go out there and say, no, you know what, there's opportunities out there. Realtors are sitting on the sidelines. It gives me an opportunity to go into the market, to have less competition, to be more impactful with my marketing, to capture a bigger marketing share. It's an opportunity for me to keep working on my business. It's an opportunity for me to systemize my business. It's an opportunity for me to do all the things I didn't have time to do when the market was really, really busy. 
those are the realtors that are really going to come out uh, come out ahead in 2023. And it's a choice. And then I keep saying this to all my realtors, whichever category you pick out of those two categories, you're going to be correct in, in right. what happens in front of you. You're so that's so correct, David. Like their truth is going to be their reality. It's they choose the path and it's no different for me and you. And we talk about this all the time on this podcast. You know, we always look at everything as from our point of view as, as small businessmen and how are we going to lead our, our businesses and, and what what changes are we going to do? We have the same challenges. And, and you know, and from my point of view, from a from a law firm, like we're not closing as many deals the second half of the year as we were in the first half of the year. We're not doing as many as we want to. If it continues you know, to be like this, it's going to be really hard on us as a firm. And we don't want to let anybody go. And we've we got great people working for us. We don't even want to have those conversations. We want to weather the storm. So we look at it the same way. How can we, is there a way that we can grab more than our market share? We can't, we don't want to just sit back and wait for agents that we already know to do some, a few deals and then send it to us. You know, you know, yeah, that's all great, but but that's not enough because they won't, as busy as they are trying to be, they may not be as busy as they were previous years. So we have to find a way as a law firm to, to try and get out there and get more than our market share. We don't want to just wait for the market to feed us. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, nobody's going to feed you in this market, not in sales, right? You got to <laughs> feed yourself. You got to be that go-getter and, and, and it has to come from within, you know, yeah. uh, meeting David Goggins at the reality conference a couple of weeks ago. I mean, what, what a impactful um, event that was, you know, and, and that was his message to the crowd. You know, you can choose to quit at any point in the game or you can push through it. Right. And the people who push through it and put in that extra effort, you know, and really reach deep. Cause I mean, David, it's not easy. It's not easy to, you know, get more market share in a declining market. It, it's not an easy uh, thing to accomplish, but it's certainly doable if you do the right things. You know, and listening right. to podcasts is, is is the first step, I would say. Well, maybe not the first step, but it's an important it's, step. It's one of the steps. It's one of the it's steps. Something right? you can do to help educate yourself, to advance your career, to motivate yourself. Like, it's it's way easier to sit at home and do nothing. But how is that going to help you? It won't, right? Right. So any event that I'm part of, any conference that I'm part of, if I'm asked to speak, that's always the first thing I say, is I always congratulate the crowd and say, listen, you're here in this room, and I want to thank you and congratulate you for taking that initiative and for investing yourself and choosing to be here, right? Because that's important. It's a choice. Yeah. And the most successful people in any industry are generally the ones that work the hardest. It's it's that simple. Now they might have something magic about them. They might have something, they might have some extra talent, but if they don't work hard, they don't succeed. And it, it applies in every line of business. It applies in everything we see. We all were just mesmerized by the World Cup and watch a one of the legends of all time, you know, Lionel Messi. Like he could have not played as hard as he did they could have not have won and he would have gone down as one of the greatest of all time but that wouldn't have been enough for him he wanted to at his age 35 36 he wanted to find that extra gear that nobody could believe that he possibly had at his age in the heat in Qatar and and that type of grueling schedule and the old one of the oldest guys in the tournament still found another gear because he was out working out hustling out thinking everybody determined Michael Jordan greatest basketball player ever was the hardest worker he took more foul shots than anybody in practice everything they work hard Gretzky worked hard like these guys it's it's not an accent they have talent but they work hard Roger Federer uh he was known for working really hard and practicing hard all the time right it, so those are just sports examples that's easy for us to point to but it's the same thing in in the business world anybody successful works hard david i uh, i used to play table tennis on a, on a team and you know the difference in my game when i when i got to the table and i had a half an hour practice session in and just practice my strokes 
the difference in my game was night and day versus me just walking up to the table and starting to play a game right away. Like it was, it wasn't even, you feel the ball difference. You, you get appreciation of, of, of the, the surrounding and the different table that you're on. The ball bounces different on different types of wood. You, you have to get, you know, acclimatized to your current surroundings, you know? And we see so many professionals walk into a room with no training, with no practice and try to blow, uh, you know, their biggest deals uh, off the table. And it's really hard to do that. You know, but if you put in the work, and I always always say, uh, hard work beats talent every time. You know, there's a lot yeah. of talented business owners out there, very talented, smart people, and and you know that's probably one of the um, the hardest thing to overcome is when you have talent but no work ethic. It's hard to be successful. Yeah, work ethic will beat talent every single day. Yeah. You know, and it's funny, like I'm a, a fly on the wall listening in on some conversations at some of these social events that I mentioned earlier. And you see, you know, some agents talking to each other and it's like, woe is me and woe is me. And, you know, I hope the market turns around in the spring because I've been doing nothing for five months. And and then you, you hear some other agents talk, well, you know, like, what have you been doing? Oh, I've been trying this and this and this and I'm doing that. Oh, that's really good. I, You know what? That's a great idea. I should do that, too. And and what, what about you? What are you doing? You know, and it's a whole different mindset and they're searching, they're looking for where they're picking each other's brains. And, and some of them are just coming, trying to, to be creative. And you see those, it's, it's a really clear difference in the dynamics of, of certain people. Yeah, it's a mind, it's a choice though, right? It's, and even when you're at those events, David, it's a choice of what circle you're in because we all know the negative people that are going to continue to, you know, say negative things. And we know the positive people. Yeah. That's a choice. It's a choice of who you're going to congregate with and who you're going to surround yourself with. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to choose to have to be part of those negative conversations? For me, I don't have the time for that. You know, I, I, I actually took a couple agents at your function aside. They said, I want, I don't, do you know so-and-so? I want you to meet so-and-so like, and just took them over to meet another agent, one of your successful agents. Just ha talk to him, have a conversation with him instead of your fellow woe is me guy that you're talking to right now. I love that. I love that. It, it, and, and, you know, who you eat lunch with matters too, right? Like at a brokerage <laughs> like mine, where there's 230 realtors, you know, take the time to get to know some of the top performers. They're, they're some of the nicest people in the industry. You know, they will, they will give you the shirt off their back. Take them out for lunch. Have a conversation with them. Ask them what they're doing. Ask them what's changed their business. Ask them what marketing works the most. Ask them what doesn't work, right? Uh, but if you don't put in the time and you don't make that choice, you're you're never going to be successful. It's yeah. going to be exponentially harder. I shouldn't say never. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we have some great topics today. Um, yeah. Yeah, we do some some sort of year end stuff. And and before we get into some of the the, the topics, you know, we we've talked. Uh, many times on these podcasts about uh, mentors and and influencers and and people that impacted our life and sometimes it's people that we you know, we know them for a long time uh, and sometimes it's people that just sort of in our lives in a shorter period of time and it's just amazing the type of impact some some people have on you and um, I'm, I'm wearing this sweatshirt today Baycrest Pro Am Hockey from a hockey tournament that I was. And it was a fundraiser, charitable fundraiser for Alzheimer. And I was in it a number of years ago. I think it was around 2005, 2006, 2007 in that time frame. And it's, it's you, you enter a team, you get your buddies, you go in, everybody has to commit to raising a certain amount of money. And each team, you, you play three team, you play three games, and each team gets a, an NHL player, a former NHL player to play with them during wow. the tournament. So that's exciting. Yeah. And, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and the way they set it up, like there was 25, 30 teams or something. Everybody attended a draft party, which was a fabulous social party downtown and, you know, cocktails, food, uh, bottle service, like really done first class, but at part of it, you, you actually have a draft. So whoever, whichever team raised the most money gets first pick in the draft. Oh, I love that. That is so, honestly so well thought of. 
Oh, it's brilliant. And, and this has been going on, I think 2005 or 2000 was the first year. It still goes on. It's the Baker's program. Everybody wants to look it up. It raises money for Alzheimer's. So anyways, the team, it was my, I, I played in a pickup hockey game with a bunch of friends for 30 years. You know, we were young guys when we started and we were old, old guys, uh, you, you know, after that. But most of the people in the tournament were in their, you know, 20s and 30s. And we were already like in, in our 50s and we entered a, a team in that. And we raised the most money. So we got first pick in the draft. So we ended up uh, picking, and these are all like mostly a lot of Hall of Fame former NHLers that you could pick from. Uh, you know, uh, Brian Troche, Mike Bossy, Dale Howard, Chuck, uh, Daryl Sittler, Wendell Clark, Doug Gilmore. Like there was Leafs, there was other legends, Paul Coffey. If, if those of you that follow hockey know all these people, but anyways, our first pick was Boreas Salming. And so the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this, obviously, is, you know, for any listeners that aren't aware, Boreas Salm is one of the greatest NHL players ever. He was probably the greatest Toronto Maple Leafs player ever. First, uh, player, first player from Europe that actually got really established in, in, um, in the NHL when he came from Sweden. And um, so we got to play with him at that year the following year we got first pick in the draft again and we picked him a, a again and uh you know and i'm mentioning all this because you know boria recently passed away unfortunately um very very tragically and he was honored in the last couple of weeks just before he he passed away he came to toronto was honored especially and it just brought back all these these memories of our experience and everything with him i can i don't know if you could see this but this is a a picture of me with Boria back then. Oh, wow. And um, really got to know him. If, actually, if I, can, if I can share my screen, I'll show you another picture. Sure, absolutely. What a, what a wonderful event, David. You know, just uh, raising money for Alzheimer's and, and, and you know, the, the draft and the picks. Like, it would just be wonderful to really be a part of that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can, if I'm sharing this properly. Yep. No, I, we see it. You see this picture here? Absolutely. With a bunch of guys. Yep. So this, I don't know if you can see in the, in the back row here, right in the middle with the white t-shirt and the, and the black jacket sort of is, is Boria Salming. And I'm in the front wearing this uh, light blue shirt. This is, this is, I think 2007 or something. So this was, was after the tournament. Uh, it's probably this, last year, a couple couple of years ago. Yeah. So, and this is just my my group of friends that I play hockey with. So, the um, one of the guys after the tournament said um, invited everybody with our spouses over to his house to have a barbecue. And after the first year, we you know Boria was invited, and he says, "Sorry, I can't make it. I get back to the hotel with all the guys." And it was a real reunion for him to see all these former players too. So we understood it. And then the second year, same thing. We invited him to come back. And he says, you know what? Um, I'll come for an hour if you guys can get me down to my hotel from there, get me in a cab or something. So he says, sure. So he comes around. Anyways, my wife and I showed up at our friend's house at about seven or so with everybody. We left at about 1130. And uh, Boria was still sitting on the couch here <laughs> holding court. Uh, cause he really sort of bonded with our, our group. We were similar age. We all actually grew up watching him play, but, and, and our, all our talk in the dressing room wasn't about hockey. You know, he told stories about that and everything, but more, we were talking about our kids and what they're going through. And some had grandchildren and, and kids at university are getting engaged, getting married and regular everyday stuff that people talk about. And I think that's why we sort of connected with them. So, um, and he reached which is which was really sad. And I'll just tell one other quick story because then we got a lot of other stuff to get onto. So this is like in May, and the following November, I'm uh, go to a Leaf game with my my older son Josh, and they had a studio set up right in front at the ACC at the time when you walked in where they did the pregame show and stuff. So we're just off to the side of the stage, you know, watching and listening to this. And I look across at the far side, and there's Boria getting all mic'd up to go on the stage. So he happens to look across and catches my eye and he sees us and he all of a sudden he starts taking off um, the microphone and he comes back and he's taking it all off and he says one, one second to the technicians putting on and he runs around the back of the stage and he comes over and I think like who's he coming to see maybe there's somebody else over there 
And he comes right over to me and gives us the biggest hug. And he says, what are you doing here? It's so nice to see you. And oh, that was and, and I'm not 100% sure he remembered my name. You know, I said, when I said, you know, it's David. And this is my son, Josh. Said, yeah, yeah, I know who you are. I'm Josh. He was in the dressing room. And what, you know, what are you guys doing here? So what are we doing here? We're here to watch the Leaf game. What are you doing in town from Sweden? <laughs> Is oh I'm an artist so I too so I have an art show so while I'm here they invite me to the game and I gotta go I gotta go back on air okay he says where are you gonna be after the first period so I said As a matter of fact we were invited to the Leafs alumni box because uh, Stu Gavin who's an ex NHL that I used to work with invited us up there he says perfect I'm gonna be there we'll have a beer and, and everything so he goes back on and I I get tapped from behind from a couple guys in suits uh it, it, similar age to me it turns out they were lawyers at a big law firm one of the downtown firms and you know they say uh excuse me but uh like how do you know Borea Salming <laughs> I said oh you know we play hockey together <laughs> <laughs> the story keeps getting more and more unbelievable <laughs> yes so I, I love telling this story obviously so um so they said no really so I told them about the Baycrest the fundraiser and they says okay you know give me your card and I gave him a card and the next day the guy called me and he says you know give me the information I've got to put a team in and they put two teams into the tournament that year I think they've been playing ever ever since oh, that's so cool yeah so anyways a fabulous experience and unfortunately you know very you know tragic um ending for him but he's one of those guys you meet at some point in life and we were so lucky that we had these opportunities with him and and listen and, and this man okay he was probably 55 ish or something and, and we we're in the dressing room with him for you know two years, you know, playing everything. This guy didn't have an ounce of fat on him. He had an incredible workout routine, stayed in an unbelievable shape. And I remember hearing that he got COVID in the first round when everybody, when it was really bad, right when it first started, and they were choosing who to treat in Spain and Italy, and we were washing our fruit and didn't know what to do at home. Um he got COVID really bad and was hospitalized. And I thought, okay, if this thing could get Boreas Salmi, he's got to be the healthy, you know, he would have been um, 67, 68, maybe at the time, but he was probably the healthiest 67 year old on the planet with, with his regime and everything. And it hospitalized him and he recovered from that. But then he, he ended up unfortunately getting Lou Gehrig's disease and earlier this year, and it, it was so fast and just uh just just took him out so fast Sorry, so anyways um it's episode 72 but I'd like to renumber it episode 21 in honor of Boreas Salming oh. <laughs> a true well, influencer in, in my life Dave a great story and I mean I think there's so many messages there you know I I, I think it's so important for people to get involved right um I think it's so important for people to um have a hobby um, and, and and to really be passionate about something, I think it grounds you as an individual, as a salesperson, as, as uh, you know, I, I think it's so, so important. So, you know, I, I think your story is impactful on a lot of different levels. Um, you need to get out there. You know, things yeah. like this aren't going to happen if you sit at home on your couch. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen by chance. You know, you, you, you got to network, you got to put in the time, you got to ask questions, you got to put yourself out there. And I think if you do good things are going to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for sharing. Okay. So I know there's a lot of stuff we wanted to, to get to today, but end of the year. And I just wanted to share that. So, but there are some, some interesting or weird, depending on how you want to look at it uh laws coming into play effective january 1st so you know given where we are at the end of the year i thought it'd be it's worthwhile for us to just talk about these a little bit yeah and i mean they're they're important you know uh, they're important rules and changes coming into effect some of them we we still don't know the meat on the bone or um, you know, the, the laws haven't really fully been uh put into uh into writing yet but we, we do know a number of things for sure. Um, and the first thing we want to talk about is Canada's new anti-flipping rules for residential real estate. And those come into effect on January 1st, uh, 2023. Yeah. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, you know, we're going to talk about that one a little bit. We're going to talk about the two-year ban on foreign buying of residential real estate. And both of these are federal 
laws, um, not provincial. Like, you know, we've gone through other stuff. Like usually the, the federal government leaves it to the provinces to deal with real estate because it's usually it's it's them that are more in tune with what should happen in their own province. So like the NRST, the non-resident speculation tax, that's a provincial law. That's Doug Ford's government dealing with that one and all the amendments and everything. But these two are, are federal. So for the life of me, I don't really understand why the federal government's doing this and why they're interfering with it because Canada's a big country. And some of this, I, you know, is designed to cool the real, when they introduce it, it's designed to cool the real estate market to some extent. And, but the real estate market in GTA, in the GTA or in Ontario is completely different from what it is in Saskatoon, right? So like our market sometimes is, is more, more of a parallel to the Vancouver market in BC. Like what goes on there a lot of times happens um, in, in Ontario as well. But if you're the premier of Saskatchewan, you want the, you need this anti-flipping rule or a two-year ban on foreign buyers the same way that that maybe it makes sense. If it does make sense, maybe it makes sense in Ontario or the GTA. But does it really apply to to Regina? Like or like so I, anyways, I, I don't understand it from that point of view. I think uh I, I think it's a money grab pure and simple, right? When I look at the Canada's new anti-flipping rules for residential real estate, and I mean, it's it's designed to reduce speculative demand, according to them, in the marketplace and help cool excess, excessive price growth, right? right? But really what they're doing is anybody that is flipping properties and um, they're doing this uh, consecutively or, or within the span of a year, uh, the government is uh, changing uh, the classification of what they're doing from capital gain to business income, right? Right. And and business income uh, is something that you do on a consistent, regular basis uh, to to earn your living. Um, you know, I know a lot of people in in the real estate industry, um, as do you, David, and I'm sure you've heard these stories. But you know, I I, I know of an instance where. Um, a developer who has multiple businesses and one of which he flips homes, uh, he flipped 13 properties in a span of four years, right? And he paid capital gains on every single one. He, you know, he, he properly did his books, but the government came back to him and said, you know what, 13 properties in four years, that's not your regular, you know, hey, I bought a property and you know, I, I sold that after some time, changed my plans, you know, that's a capital gain. But if you're buying with the intention of reselling and flipping, and you're doing it in, in a short period of time, the government has every right to come back and reassess that, hey, you know what, this is not really, you know, you kind of uh, investing in real estate. This is another business that you own, right? And the government actually reassessed them, and he had to pay $1.6 million dollars in additional tax over and above the capital gain that he already paid and he hired yeah. well, a, a big accounting firm and a big law firm and you know this went to court and went all the way up uh you know the, the court process and he lost and ultimately yeah the government classified his activities as a business activity and not as an investment activity yeah, at some point, like there's a threshold that you cross. So the way that the law, just to pull it back a little bit, the way the law has always worked for people that are just buying a property and it's their principal residence. Okay, it's clearly their principal. They live a place. Doesn't matter if you live there for a year. You live there for twenty years. When you sell it, it because it's your principal residence, you don't pay capital gains on it. And and it's been the law in Canada for forever. It seems okay. So, so, so if it's your principal residence, you're actually living there, you move in, you, you know, and your circumstances change a year later, you decide to live somewhere else, you sell it, you did well on it, let's say, so you, but you're not taxed on it. And you buy the next one, you, you live there for a while, you sell it, you're still not taxed on it. So most people take advantage of that. It's a great way to increase your, your, your personal wealth over time as you're, as you're moving up and, and you're never taxed on it. But then at some point, 
that crosses the line. If you're buying, buying and the government gave you another break, if you're buying the odd property as an investor, and then you earn a capital gain on it and you sell it, you're not, it, you pay capital gains tax, but capital gains is only tax on 50% of the gain. It's not on 100% of the gain. So they gave you that leeway. And now there's, but then there's a third level. And that's what, if you're doing this all the time, or, and, and no one, define, how do you define all the time? There's a threshold. And at some point, the government says, you've crossed that threshold. You're doing this regularly. So it, you're really just, this is a business. So if it's a business, the full amount is taxable as business income. It's not 50% of the capital gain that's taxable. It's 100% of the profit is taxable because you're doing this regularly. So you're in the business. So that's sort of the way it's always been. But now they're, you know, they're really coming down with this law saying we're going to be more aggressive with everybody to determine whether or not you're flipping properties. And if you're flipping, we want we want our like you say, we want our our money grab. Right. We don't we're not happy that you're going to get all the, the advantage of doing the, the work and flipping it. We want to share in your success. We want to be a partner in business. We want to be partners. <laughs> Now they haven't offered if you if you have to sell because things turn really bad and you sell for a loss, the government I don't think in their legislation has offered if you have to flip at a loss we're we're your partner so we will share in that with you and and <laughs> but but they're happy to share in the gains. Yeah, and I think the latter has been uh, in the courts. Like I mean, I I know that there was a um, a court case a really long time ago where um, a gentleman bought a whole bunch of stocks and it was widely known that that particular stock is going to go down. Like it was widely known, like it was everybody in the industry knew that that company's suffering, it's going to go down. So the government took him to court saying, hey, we're not going to allow you to credit this against your 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 gains because you ought to know better. And the judge said, no, 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 you don't get to play it both ways. <laughs> you know, if, if you want people's income, then you got to allow them to, you to know, have losses. It's their losses. So the government lost that case. And I have a feeling in this case, they, they, they'd probably lose too, right? Um, if there is a loss and they classify it as business income, then it gets offset against other business income. Uh, and the same with capital gains. If there's a loss on your capital gain, you can offset it against other capital gains, not 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 business income. So it's right. important to have that distinction. Yeah. But with this rule, the government is really saying that, hey, anything that you own less than 365 days will automatically now be classified as business income. Um, versus a capital gain. Yeah, like they're they're not trying to discourage people from investing in real estate, you know, and, and and you and I are always trying to encourage people to do that. Like there's a lot of advantage. Even if you pay tax on it, it, it still would make sense to do it. What they're really targeting is the short-term flips um, in the market. They don't want properties to be turned around on, on a real short-term basis, you know, which, which is interesting. Again, this is a federal law. You know, when we talk about land transfer tax, which is provincial, and in the city of Toronto, there's a city of Toronto land transfer tax, they have a different take on all this. Like when you do sell a property or when someone buys a property, you pay land transfer tax. So you could buy a property in the city of Toronto, you pay land transfer tax. If you flip it in a short period of time, aside from dealing with this flipping rule, whoever buys that property from you pays land transfer tax again. Yep. to the province, to the city of Toronto. If they flip it again during that same year, they the new buyer pays land transfer tax again. You could yep. flip a property as many times as you want. And the government, the, the municipal government and the provincial government, happy to take land transfer tax each single time. Yep. Okay, with land transfer tax. So interesting. So they're not discouraging it on that level. They love having the revenue from the land transfer tax. Here the federal government is trying to, clamp down on the short-term flipping so now there's you know wait you know if, if you're buying a property the intention of flipping you, you got to hang on to it for yeah. a period of time and and david we're talking about substantial amounts here like land transfer tax um you know there, there's a realtor that um used the statistical data that we have about how many properties uh exchange hands and then he basically um took the average sale price and then did simple mathematics and found out that 
you know, the numbers are ast astonishing on, on how much land transfer tax is actually paid in the province. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, people wouldn't believe how high that number is. It's, it's a lot of money and, and land transfer tax is a formula based on the purchase price. So as prices get pushed up in, in the crazy markets we've, we've been going through, uh, it's paid on the on the price, you know, regardless of what the price is. It, it's it's a formula based on the purchase price. So the gr higher the price, the more land transfer tax is paid. So it's a it's a great uh, source of cash for the government. It really is. So I, I think we should switch gears a little bit and go on to the next piece of legislation. You read my mind. I was just going to say the second most impactful piece of legislation that's being proposed. And, you know, there's there's a lot of conversation surrounding this topic is the two year ban on foreigners buying residential real estate in Canada. And this is an interesting one because the government announced this months ago. Uh, we're just around the corner from January 1st. Has the legislation actually been uh, written have we seen anything in writing from the government surrounding this yeah well you know they announced it in a budget last spring that they were going to do this and, and you remember you know at the time we were in a crazy real estate market prices are being put up, being pushed up we're still multi-offer bidding and some of this uh, i guess is is them thinking the foreign buyers are really having a big effect on our market which i think you and i've discussed many times when we talk about the nrst it, it's not based in fact it's it's five or six percent of the market that's really driven by by foreigners but anyways in their wisdom they said okay let's ban foreigners for two years so they pass they they announce it in a budget they do pass legislation that sort of outlines what the terms are going to be but but most of the detail it was going to be provided in future reg in regulations that will be provided at some point in time so we call these future regulations that'll really give us you know the fine print how this is supposed to work uh you know who's the, who's going to be defined clearly as a non-canadian who's this going to affect what type of property is it going to affect uh what type of exemptions might there be it's all supposed to be in these regulations so we're december 21st today it's supposed to come into effect january 1st we still don't have the regulations so there's still some uncertainty so part of me is still thinking maybe they're just going to pull the plug on this they've been they've had a lot of negative feedback a lot of lobbying against this because it doesn't make sense um, in so many ways maybe they're just going to pull the plug on it but I don't know maybe they're going to go ahead and you know and and produce some regulations at some point in time so so we don't know so all we could do is talk about what we do know um you know because because we, we you know or what we think we know and it's all subject to change with regulations so you know who's defined as a as a non-canadian like some of it is sort of obvious it's someone you know, not a canadian citizen or a permanent resident um the, the, we know for sure just like the nrst they're going to try and close potential loopholes people doing it through trusts or people acquiring through a corporation you know, like what if i just incorporate a company and i'm just a, i'm a foreigner i'll just I'll get a Canadian to be a uh, to be a direct officer and director, but I'll be a shareholder. So no, they're going to close that off right away, just like the NRST, and they won't allow you to, someone to buy it in trust for a foreigner. So they're going to we we know they're going to try and close off loopholes that people are already scheming to do, but we don't know the detail. We don't know exactly who what the exemptions are going to be. There's still a lot of uncertainty, and we're. 10 days away from this coming into force. Yeah, and I mean, I know there's going to be exemptions too, right? So they talked about refugees. They talked about individuals who purchase for a residential property with their spouses or common law partners. If that spouse or common law partner is eligible to purchase residential property in Canada, I mean, that's kind of contradicting itself because how do you determine eligibility under this new statute if you don't actually have the regulations uh, surrounding the, the the fine print, but I guess what they're saying is that if one of the purchasers uh, is is a permanent resident or a Canadian citizen, then that would be allowed. Yeah, if they're spouses. If they're spouses. So, so if, if a married couple are going to buy and and the wife is a Canadian citizen but the husband isn't, they're going to allow it as opposed to say because there's a non-Canadian buying it that taints it. You can't do it. They're saying no. If your spouses 
we're, we're going to allow that. Okay. Which is a little different from, you know, NRST was going the other way. Like if any non-Canadian, you know, was involved in the transaction that tainted it for everybody and the NRST is payable on hundred percent of the purchase price. So here that's going to be a little bit different. So that one sort of makes sense. If you're yeah. a legitimate yes. married People couple. punish, you know, Canadians, uh, uh, in, in this legislation, that would be right. really unfair, right? And right. then the other exemption is temporary residence in Canada, right? Uh, such as uh, students or foreigns. Um, uh, my, my foreigners, my understanding is that uh, uh, they will also be allowed to purchase resident, uh, real estate, residential real estate. Yeah, and again, that's similar to, to what happened with NRST. There was a um, rebate. It wasn't as an exemption. It was really done as a rebate. So you have to pay the NRST, but then if you qualified over a period of time and you meet all the, the, the qualifications, you can get it back if you were a student um, you know, that met certain criteria or if you're on a working permit and you met certain criteria, you get it back. Here, we're not sure exactly, is it going to be an exemption? Is it going to be a, you know, it can't be a rebate because you're either, because in this law, you're either allowed to buy real estate or you're not allowed to buy real estate. It's not like you can buy it and pay something. You're you're, you're prohibited. So if a if a non-Canadian buys something, the transaction is terminated by the government. Okay. Even if they find out after the fact, the transaction is terminated. It's not like they're pay, you're paying an additional tax or something on it. So it's a different type of legislation. It's, it's very weird. And the thing that really caught my eye in, in the, what we know about the law so far is the enforcement and penalty provisions that they put in here. Because they know as soon as you announce something like this, and it was no different with NRST, everybody is coming up with a scheme or a way around it, trying to find a loophole, try and come a way around it. So what they're doing is they're saying, not only are we going to penalize the, the parties that are trying to buy it, because we're going to terminate their transaction, okay, not allow them, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll re, we as the government will resell the property. Okay, we'll step in and resell the property, but they want to. But they're going to be providing penalties to a very broad range of people that are involved in giving advice, or may have given advice, or may have aided or assisted them in trying to get around this legislation. So, David, you as a as a real estate agent, you as a as a real estate owner broker, could be paying it. Me as a lawyer, if I'm advising my law clerk. If she's giving, you know, trying to help them and giving somebody to try and get around this, and it turns out uh, the, the transaction is terminated and they're not allowed to do it, not only can they terminate, but they can come after all of us, their, their accountant, their mortgage broker, anybody that was part of the transaction, part of the process that they determined that you were involved in trying to get around this, you could be, each one of us can have a fine of $10,000 on a transaction. So that's really important for us all to note and for all the agents out there to note and the lawyers out there and everybody else. And this is applied to, it, it, they're, they're go after developers, you know, it, people that are, you know, trying to encourage it in a sales office. So yeah, we, you know, we think you're a foreign, but you know what, here's a way we can get around this, right? right? So they'll go after the developer too, 10,000 bucks. And David, of course, this applies to any contractual ob obligations that arise prior to January 1st. Sorry, does not apply to any contractual obligations that were right. prior to January 1st, 2023, applies for anything entered after that date. And, and we don't know how conditional contracts are going to be dealt with prior to January 1st, 2023. Uh, that become unconditional after January 1st. So uh, there's a little bit of a gray period there. I guess right. we're going to have to wait for the future regulations to really come out to, 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 to tell us how, how that's going to be handled with. But you're absolutely right. The enforcement and penalties of this are fine up to $10,000. That's sub substantial. And it's really important for everybody to, in, the, in our industry to understand that and to uh, you know avoid that at uh, all costs and 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 you know don't let yourself be part of those conversations just say look this is this is the law this is what the government came out with and you know whether we agree with it or not it, it's it's something that uh, everybody has to abide by yeah and, and we just have to be very careful because it's not just our clients that could get in trouble with this it's us personally 
that could get in trouble with this. And yeah, you know, you want to earn a, a commission, but you want to, but you're not going to get your commission if if it's a non-Canadian that was buying it because the transaction will be terminated. So not only you're not getting your commission, but now you might pay a ten thousand dollar fine. So like, be really careful, okay? And we got to be careful as lawyers too, and in, in asking the right questions, doing our due diligence work from our client, and and uh, you know, it's one thing if our clients lie to us. But we can't be willfully blind to it. We have to be asking the right questions and doing the right due diligence to 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 determine it. We can't just say, "Don't I don't want to know. I don't want to hear about it. Don't tell me that you're really nice. I don't want to know." Blah 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 blah. But you know, you, know you, you can't do that. That's being willfully blind. And they made that clear already. You can't do that. You have to take some steps to determine if they're Canadian or non-Canadian for the purposes of legislation. So interesting one my hope is that they just pull the plug on it at some point but and and then let's say it, it doesn't so this will go ahead for two years so foreigners will be banned from buying for two years the government can always change their mind and it may not last two years the government might be voted out and in because we're in a minority government and then the next government might cancel it so like who knows but we, we have to live with it for now so we got to be careful with it because it, it does right now it does exist and you're coming in yeah and the third peculiar head scratcher is what the city of toronto recently did with the vacant home tax yeah and <laughs> we've been getting calls and emails daily and i know you've had questions on this too so this is city of toronto um imposing a tax they they want to they want to make sure that properties, because we have a, a scarcity um, in in the city of Toronto of places for people to live. So they don't like the idea that some, there are properties all over the place, whether they're residential homes or there's a lot of condominiums that are just sitting vacant. They're owned by people. They're not renting them out. They're not, you know, they're not, people aren't living in them. So they're really, the purpose of this is try to encourage everybody to not have your property vacant. You can own a property, you can be an investor, but if you bought a residential home and as an investment that maybe you're going to flip at some point in time, or maybe you can use it, but it's sitting vacant, they're trying to encourage you to, you got two options, either rent it out or pay a tax on it being vacant. And I get, and presumably they're using the tax money at some point to develop more residential properties i don't know or it's a cash grab David, but they do don't want properties to be has, vacant do you think the government has heard of something called the charter of rights and freedoms <laughs> do you think uh they've heard of this important piece of legislation that we passed almost 50 years ago that uh you know protect uh, certain basic uh rights of canadians because i mean you know not that i want this to get into a political conversation but <laughs> I, I look at something like that and I scratch my head. I'm like, you know, this is such a violation on, on basic property rights. It's it's really a head scratcher how the government can get away with something like this. Yeah. And I, I, I get the justification. Like, I get why they're doing it. You know, I, I understand the, the mindset and, and, and the thought process here. But it, I, it just, it's a head scratcher for me. Yeah, yeah, me too. Like, I, I appreciate the fact that um, city of Toronto is a great place to live. It really okay. is. GTA is a great place to live. People want to live in it. People don't want to move out. People want to get in. So, and and there's a shortage of, of places. So what's the government going to do? You know, you know, part of the strategy should be at every level of government. Let's encourage more development. Let's allow greater density. Let's, but do it the right way. You got to build the infrastructure and, and have all that in place too, if you're going to increase density in, in certain places and, and open up places for development. So that certainly will do it, but, but that takes time. So, so there are, you know, and I know uh, the provincial government's taking some aggressive steps now to try and to get the development uh, of certain uh, land in Ontario, you know, going faster, but it takes a long time. Right. So I think they're looking in the short term, what can we do to free up some properties? Because they think there's a lot of properties that are just sitting there vacant. Who knows if they know how many properties are actually vacant? Because what you know, they pass this legislation, and what they're doing is they're saying everybody that owns a property 
in the city of Toronto has to file a declaration once a year. The first time will be in February 2023 to, to a declaration to confirm that their property is not vacant. Or if it is vacant, they're going to pay a tax, which is 1% on the, of the current value of that property. Or there's certain exemptions that we're allowing, we're allow it to be vacant for a period of time if you meet one of these five or six exemptions. But every single person has to file this declaration. Now, the reality might be, you know, like, what's the vacancy rate? Well, I don't know, maybe you know, David, you know, is it 2%? Is it 5%? Is it 10%? But 100% of the people have got to go through this process for them, for the government to be able to find out that it's all, you know, that we have vacancies in 2% or like, like they could have 98% that don't, but everybody's got to file this declaration. So people are panicked. They're getting notices right now saying, oh, the government, they're after me. I, you know, I've got to um, pay this fine or 1% of my value or, but I'm living in there or, or I'm not living there, but I'm, it's under renovation. It's that's why it's been vacant for five months because we're renovating it so we can move in. Yeah. And uh, one of my customers uh, actually got a threatening phone call from the city of uh, Toronto. Um, and, and, and I mean, you know, he has a $7 million penthouse, right? So 1% of the value of that is, is, is a lot of money. And he was right. with with receiving a bill if if he doesn't file this declaration. I mean, he still has a month to go to file the declaration. And they're already calling uh, people and and threatening them, right? And you know, if the vacancy rate is really low, then you know, I I think the other way uh, approach would have been uh, more realistic. You know, I think um, you have to file a declaration if your property is vacant. And uh, if, if at any point it's determined that your property was vacant and you didn't file a declaration, then there would have been substantial fines. And I think that's the better way of kind of approaching the problem than making everybody file a declaration and looking for that small percentage of the people who, who, uh, who are vacant. And, uh, um, you know, uh, I think that's a better way of, of kind of dealing with the problem. But, you know, that's not for you and I to decide. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are panicked and a lot of people are really worried about, uh, uh, you know, this policy coming to effect and, and what it's going to do. Now, let, let's just talk about the exemptions. So um, if a death of a registered owner uh, occurred, you're exempt. Repairs or renovations, which you've already mentioned. Uh, well, principal residence is in care. What, yeah, what if, that means like whoever would normally be living there um, is has been hospitalized and is, is going through some treatment or something and you know and I have a client who's who, who's like that you know he's, he's going through uh, you know some cancer treatment so he hasn't been so he's how do they know that I haven't been home for the last couple months? I've been in and out of the hospital you know how do they know like they got police out there checking or and no they always know they're just sending this notice to everybody they don't know this is the way they're they want everybody to tell it they want everybody to tell you whether or not you are living at home or whether it's vacant like most people are receiving this for properties that that are vacant right now and they're going like how do they know that it's vacant like who's been looking through my windows or some they got people st sitting outside to see if anybody comes home at night or turns on the lights like exactly how how do they know that my house is vacant or my condo is vacant well the, the answer is they don't you know they, they don't they're sending this notice out to everybody and they're saying everybody has to file because that's how they're going to determine whether they it might be vacant or not vacant. Now, you know, and they're going to be going around randomly and challenging some of these things, or I don't know. But anyways, so if you are, if you know, you own a home, you're actually living there. It is your residence, but you happen to be, you know, you have to go to the hospital for a month. You know, that shouldn't make your house a vacant house subject to the tax. Right. So that's one of the, one of the exemptions. Right. And then I guess they have transfer of uh, legal ownership. So the property's uh, in the process of being conveyed or, or, or sold. Right. Right. Uh, like there's there's a lot of times when we do our regular transactions, there's a period of time where, where a property will be, be vacant. Someone, you know, they bought and sold and they uh, maybe they sold for or they bought first. So they moved out and their closing isn't for a couple months later on their sale. So maybe there's nobody living there for a couple months. Like that's a normal thing. So if it's a normal thing, that's the declaration that you're filing. You know, it's vacant because we're between properties, you know, and so so you're not subject to it. 
right? And then we have occupancy for full-time employment. Yeah, is it, that's one of the exemptions and, and a court order would be the other one if, if there's a court order for some reason. Um, you know, and, and again, you got to look at the facts of each one of these. So, you know, we are getting called, you know, for, for most people that are just living in their own property and it's not vacant and it's their principal resident, you know, filing the exemption after you do it one time this year, and we have to help certain people get through that to file the declaration, then it should be easy. Once they get used to this is what you do, you click here, you go on here, and it shouldn't be a big deal. But for those that actually have to seek one of these exemptions and see if they qualify, now they got to, they probably got to retain a lawyer to help guide them through this. You know, do I meet these, the tests of one of these exemptions? Right. And I, I think this is an excellent area where realtors can add additional value or even touch base or reach out to their to their clients if they have anybody that lives within the city of Toronto and, and guide them through this process. You know, uh, it's a great way to connect. It's a great way to add value, not to take away from uh, the hard work and, and, and the important work that you guys do, David, because, um, you know, if 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 clients have to determine which one of those exemptions they fall under. Um, I think that should be uh, done you know, together with their lawyer, not their realtor, because we don't offer that kind of advice. But if there's a simple situation out there, reach out to your clients, you know, be that shoulder they can lean on and help them through this process. And it's a great way to connect with them. And it's a great way to uh, add value and, and, and be that uh, uh, source of uh, wisdom for them. Yeah, and, and I could tell you, you know, the policy in, in our law firm, and I, I haven't really had a chance to talk to other lawyers about it, but but our reaction is, like, we don't want to charge legal fees for this. Um, you know, it, like, you know, why why should the, you know, the homeowner that's clearly living in their own home have to pay anything for this to, to file this additional declaration? Why should they incur $500 or $1,000 legal fees or something like that? Like, so, so we don't want to. So, so our response was, you know, we drafted up a standard letter and so we get these inquiries and we send it to our clients with a whole bunch of frequently asked questions and, and, and a summary thing. And, and we sort of outline the exemptions and we give them the links where they can go on and say, you know, here's a bunch of information and please, you know, go try and do this yourself because it's, it's supposed to be designed. You can do it yourself and you don't have to retain a lawyer and pay a lawyer to, to do this. So to the extent that people can like, you know, just do it. Here, here's some inf useful information. Here's the links. Here's the basic terms. Here's a bunch of questions you probably have, and here's some answers for them. And try and figure it out yourself without incurring, without retaining us and, and incurring costs. Okay. Because, you know, this just rubs me the wrong way to do otherwise. I don't look at this. Oh, great. Let's, we're getting all these questions. Let's charge everybody a thousand bucks and we'll, and we'll give them this advice. So, you know, I don't want to do that. Now, for some people, <laughs> You know they're going to be in a bit of a gray area and they're not sure if they qualify so yeah they might have to retain us to you know let's go through your facts let's see if you you know and, and if we have to do it we'll, we'll do it but it just i don't know this this leaves a bad taste in my mouth yeah no i agree david do you mind sharing that document in my office and uh, sure. I to share with my with my realtor so they can share it with uh with their clients as well i you know i, I think the more eyes we get on it the more uh, help we uh we, we, we give out there the better. Yep. Right. Well, you know, three really uh, big uh, changes coming into effect and um, you know, what a way to uh, end uh, 2022. Yeah. Um, you know, it ends with, with some more uncertainty. We have uncertainty of the, of the market itself. Uh, I remind myself and everybody that I, that I talk to, you know, that it is December we're normal in a normal, really busy market, real estate market. We're usually in a quieter period now, anyways, right? December is generally quieter, January is quieter, February, and then it starts to ramp up in the spring, and it does most years. So I, I'm really hopeful this year will be no exception. I think people will be using this time to, to assess their their position in life and, and really figure out what they can afford real estate wise and maybe reset their sites. And figure out, you know, now that some property prices have actually come down. So even the mortgage, 
interest is higher but if you if you do the math they might be paying the same amount if because they're paying lesser on the purchase price but a higher interest rate so it might be close so people got to figure that type of thing out so i'm hopeful we're going to get into a spring market that will be a more typical spring market things will start ramping up and um and some of the uncertainty that we've been dealing with in the fall is going to go away just as the the weather starts to improve so I'm hopeful for that. And then we're going to, you know, deal with these three pieces of legislation, see what happens with the uncertainty that's creating as well. Yeah, inventory levels are still very low. So, you know, when you when you contradict or contract the supply side, there's still lots of demand. There's still lots of people out there. And, you know, people are trying to get in before this foreign buy, a buyer's ban goes into effect. People are trying to get into the market before interest rates uh, <laughs> increase you know people still have pre-approvals with lower interest rates so they're desperate to try to look for properties where they can get into the market so they can lock in those lower rates so we're still seeing lots and lots of movements one of my newer realtors showed seven properties in the last two or three days and all seven properties literally sold within uh, 48 hours of being on the market uh, th those were uh, t townhouses in Burlington under eight hundred thousand dollars. So lots of movements in in, uh, in those uh, categories. But we're seeing lots of movements in in all kinds of different categories because there's just a lack of inventory out there. So uh, realtors ask me, is it a good time to list? It is a great time to list just because people are going to have a little bit more time right now. Not everybody is celebrating Christmas uh, and inventory levels are still record low. So don't wait until the spring market list now and, and take advantage of the fact that there's less competition out there in the market. There's less realtors transacting out there in the market because of their mind shift. Take advantage of that. There's tons of opportunities out there. And I think the people who put in the hard work, who make the right decisions, who invest in their business, who have the right attitude, who work hard, those are the realtors uh, that are going to be rewarded in 2023. Well said, David. And uh, I'm, I'm with you on that 100%. When things are, are tough, it's a challenge, but you turn it into an opportunity. That's the key word, opportunity. This is an opportunity. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to, it's, it's an opportunity, right? So, so be that guy yeah, or that's, that lady. That's going to be the word that we're going to be celebrating the most, I think, in 2023 is, you know, you got to shift your mindset to create more opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. David, this is so much fun. Uh, you know, I uh, we accomplished quite a bit as well in, in 2022 and podcast 72 completed and it felt like 10 seconds like they always do. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we'll take a little break and we'll be back to it in in the new year with uh, a new podcast, new guests, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to all that. So in the meantime, uh, happy new year, happy holidays and season's greetings to everybody and happy new year. And let's have a, a good, healthy start to uh, to next year for everybody and enjoy enjoy the holiday time right now like that's important recharge your batteries enjoy some family time some time with friends and uh recharge your batteries and, uh, and then we'll get out there in the new year absolutely merry christmas everybody happy new year we'll see you guys in the new year thank you everybody